So Chuck has talked some about how you can use interactive heat maps in some of the analysis that you do. And I want to talk specifically about CoolMap, um, which is one of these kinds of bioinformatics <coughs> tools that's relatively um, a new class of interactive visualizations for uh, translational medicine, basically. They've been around for a long time with other domains, but they're really just coming into their own with <coughs> systems biology. So why is it important to have interactive heat maps in this case? Um, what they allow you to do is to look at large volumes of data and to find patterns visually in those data. We exploit our visual system for being able to recognize patterns, both what we expect to see and find things that we don't expect to see. And let us then take multiple different perspectives on the same data um, to get us to understand our data much better. Analytically, basically these processes let you get to know your data progressively better. I just kind of want to bring to mind something that George said, not necessarily one of the main things that he said, but in passing, he talked about how you keep constantly getting to know your data better and better and the relationships in it. And if you think about it, a lot of those ways that you were doing that was seeing the different visuals that were coming out of statistical analysis. That whole notion of progressively getting to know your data, knowing what those buried relationships of biological meaning in there really is a matter of you bringing your own expertise to the data and seeing the patterns that you know with the kind of biological knowledge that you have. And you progressively then build a mental model of what you're seeing and begin to turn that into stories. And in fact, there's been a number of cognitive science studies that show exactly that, that people turn quantitative representations of visual data into qualitative explanatory models. Okay, That doesn't mean that those are the right stories. I think anybody who has done work with interactive visualizations will be the first to say, I could make any story out of that. Okay, But they also then let you see how plausible is that story. You can keep looking into your data. How valid is that story? And send you to other tools and other statistical analyses and maybe even back to the way that you normalize your data to see whether that was the problem that you're coming into. So they'll give you an opportunity to move pretty quickly through your data in a way where you can build up this mental model. Of course, and one of the most important things is that it has to be at a pretty low cost to you, so it's really important for them to be usable. Okay, so one of the things with CoolMap is we have tested this on a number of students in different genetics upper level classes, and people get up to running pretty much without much training on it, maybe 15 minute introduction in about 10 minutes. And so it's something that you can use just to check things out and then go off and, and do other tools. To give you an idea, of the challenge of large volumes of data. This is a picture of a 300 by 6,000 matrix. Um, and yes, you can begin to see different patterns with the different colors in it. But why do you need interactivity? Because you can't see the values when you're at this point. And when you zoom in to see the values, you can't see the labels. Okay, And so it's really very difficult to look at something like this on a single sheet or even a number of screens. Metaboanalyst gives you, as, as Chuck had showed, gives you interactive heat maps for this. So you might want to find out um, what the significant changes are. And you can use this wizard up here, and you can put in the parameters that you want, and you want the top 25 significant molecules, and you'll get the next graph of it. Um, and that moves you through, and it reduces the volume, and it's really very good for that. The one thing it doesn't do is it doesn't let you interact directly with the data, and it doesn't give you the context of what was filtered out, and maybe there's something that's in the 35th that's really interesting to you biologically, and you don't see that. And so um, we have a base cool map more on the notion of directly manipulating graphics to interact with them so that you can bring your knowledge to bear on it and begin to find insights from them. And basically that's called visual analytics. There's a whole field of visual analytics that has developed over the past 10 years, especially um, in biology. And you know anybody who's interested can go and take a look at some of that. So you have direct manipulation 
in terms of, of seeing how to interact with the visuals and you cumulatively, cumulatively make sense of the data and you begin to progressively build these, these possible um, descriptions and explanations. So in this talk, what I want to do is to just walk through the visual analytics the cool map lets you do when you interact with it. Um, I'm going to focus on the displays and the interactivity so you know what's possible. Um, it's really something that I would really urge you to look at as one of many things in your toolkit. And I can't emphasize the one of many enough because one of the things that you're going to do, and I think what we're seeing now is the beginning of that next part of the workflow of the analysis part, there's so many different ways to analyze your data so that you can begin to grow more and more confident about them. Um, I'm going to look at two different types of display of CoolMap, one with samples and values and the other correlation matrix. In the one with the sample and values, I'm going to show how you can easily see relationships with similar values. And also, what CoolMap lets you do is to define your own groups, what CoolMap calls an ontology. And that helps you reduce the volume of these huge data sets and also lets you group your data according to your experimental content. Um, and so you begin to bring into your groupings biological meaning. In the correlation matrix, I will look specifically at a current example that was just in the literature using CoolMap of how they grouped it by metabolic pathways. Um, also, how you can see significance and correlation values together and exploring clinical measures um, with metabolites. And then I'll try to recap the exploratory analysis that we've gone over today. So in terms of the samples and values, this again is the PUFA data and um, this is the lipid part. Now, what I think is interesting about this, and I have to check and I should have done this before the presentation, but I think this is an early data set of it. And so part of where, why it's an early data set is all of the visual exploration that Chuck and others in his lab did did not start showing things that they were expecting to see. And so they went and they really looked at that data again and saw what they might need to rerun and all of that. And so, you know, in real life, it has a value in that way. But this has 1,062 lipids, both in positive and negative modes, 17 controls, four non-alcoholic fatty liver disease people with three time points. Okay, three time points of before the baseline, the after PUFA, and the after carbs. Hmm. Um, so interactively, you want to get the big picture with just, let's say, you just want to highlight the um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease people. And so what you can do in terms of interactivity, and this is what I just want to walk through, the kinds of things you can do, is you can select just those groups that you want across the rows. So we're just doing the NAFLs with baseline, visit four, and visit seven. And then you can begin, the way that you really work with a heat map is you either read across rows and see what the patterns are, or you read down the columns and see what the values are and what seems to be similar with each other. Um, that problem of needing to zoom in or zoom out and not being able to saw, see the labels, one of the things with the heat map that you can do when it's interactive is that you can develop it so that whatever you hover over here also gives you the whole context so that you can see your, what your labels were on the columns and on the rows as well as the value of a specific cell. As with static heat maps, you could do hierarchical clustering um, and you could do them just as in the metabol analyst one picture that I showed you. You can order it so that you keep your samples intact on the rows and just cluster what's going on with the lipids. Okay. <laughs> or you can do it on both and then you get a clustering on both of them. Um, and then you can begin to see patterns. Um, when we have watched how people work with these, what they do is they spend a lot of time on the dendrograms. As Chuck has talked about, you try to find the clusters that re might mean something, and you find the ones that are pretty close together. And then you can focus in on just a small cluster here and a small cluster here. 
and see what those values are. Um, and what you see here is a mixture of controls and disease cohorts and different visits. And you might want to look into, like, why is that so? Why are they mixing like that? Another thing you can do, and this is specific to cool map, not all interactive heat maps, is you can make your own self-defined groups. Okay, so in this case, you can create different groupings based on lipid class. And what you need to do is just create an ontology and read it in so that you, oops, so that you have the lipid class down here and those are all the members of the class, they're called children in there. And then you can see that you just group on just those lipid classes. You still have all the individual visits and the controls and NAFLs, and you can just see that you've now reduced the volume of it tremendously. And you've also now given, you can do the median or the mean. This one happens to be the median. You can also group your data into cohorts and your visits. So we have just the NAFLs, just the controls, and then we have just the visit one of the NAFLs, just the visit one of controls, and so on like that. And you've really greatly reduced your heat map there. So then you're looking for an aggregate of interest. And you're really at a high level now looking at aggregates. And your values are very different. You know, they're not as spread out now that you just have the mean means or medians. And so what you are starting to look for, and Chuck had mentioned this when he showed the QOMAP before, is you see some of them haven't changed at all for either controls or NAFL. You've got some of them have a checkerboard. Okay, so the control is pretty much the same all the way through, and the NAFL is pretty much the same all the way through. So what you're running to look for is something that's probably not all the same all the way through, or not a checkerboard, but something where there's some changes. And it's somewhat hard to tell here. You know, Chuck had talked about how triglycerides were really important. You don't see much change all the way through there, and we're going to look at that in a second. But you also see some of the phospholipids have some changes, very slight changes down here. And you might want to look at those. Okay, so this is just, again, you're just really quickly going through your data and really seeing what is it that you see. You're going to bring your biology to it, and so some of them are going to be worth looking at and some aren't, but it helps you do that. So to help you see if it's worth looking at or not, the interactivity that you have in the heat map also lets you change the color coding. So these are aggregates, and you might want to say, well, within these aggregates, how are the members distributed? You know, are there, is there a lot of variation in it? And so you can color code by standard deviation. And you can see how variant the triglycerides are there, okay? Even though they were all, when the median came, they were all of one color, okay? And you can begin to see which ones aren't varied very much, the ones that are black. And then you can decide which ones you want to look into here, if any of them. Um, you might see what you're expecting. You might not see what you're expecting. But if you want to, you can cross-reference the two maps so that you can decide that. And if you want to look into any of them, you just have to open up that one ontology, um, and then you'll see all the members, and you can open up all the cohorts and visits and see that as well. So it's a way of drilling into your data seeing it in aggregate form, and seeing a, a lot of different kinds of relationships for very large data sets. So correlation matrices let you look at your data from different perspectives. And I want to give some different examples of correlation matrices um, and show you what some of these are. The first one isn't exactly a correlation matrix, but I want to show it to you because it's the example from the Curlin et al. article that was just published, um, Integrative Metabolic Signatures for Hepatic Radiation. And I urge you to look at this because it's, it's a really good article in terms of walking through a number of methods in terms of analyzing data from a number of different ways. Um, and what they really did was they were looking for biomarkers for radiation-induced liver disease. And they looked at plasma and liver samples from mice given different doses of radiation at different times. And then they looked at the metabolites in a, various, a lot of different ways, um, including clustering them regardless of the radiation dose. And as part of this, they developed an ontology, a pathway ontology for their data. Okay, and so they placed their different metabolites into different 
pathways. And they read that into their, one of their many um, heat maps that they made. Okay, so a lot of this was really, really not very, you know, it's, this is not a quick and let's look at this right away. They are a lot of statistics behind what they did here. Okay, and I'm saying that as a caveat so that when you see your data visualized in something like this and it's been derived in a number of different ways, you need to really take that into consideration. Um, and anybody collaborating with you needs to take that into consideration as well. And so they really were trying to find out which uh, metabolites in plasma and which in the liver um, were both significant and occurred in both type of samples, okay? And so they did a lot of analyses and statistical analyses before they ever put that data into here, okay? So that what you have here is they have, uh, their plasma data down here, and then the same metabolites from their liver data across the columns, okay? And so one of the things that they found from this was that the same unknown it has a very strong correlation coefficient in both, you know, the correlation coefficient for the liver as well as the plasma is pretty high. And then this, they took that same data and they grouped it into the pathways. And then they began to see, okay, which pathways are standing out as really strong. And so that, that gave them a way of looking at pathways that they might not have thought of ordinarily. So what I'm trying to show with this kind of direct manipulation, looking at whole data and detail within the context, is that you don't specify ahead of time what you're looking for. And because of that, you often find things that aren't expected and then really look to see, is this a novel discovery? Is this an aberration? If this is novel, you know, can we keep going with it and make it valid? And so that's one of the real strengths of doing this kind of direct manipulation and visual analytics. Other things that you can do with CoolMap, um, we've seen a couple of graphs like this. These are often published graphs, and we've seen some coming from um, the Michigan labs here. And what they're showing is they're showing correlations that are also significant. And so the asterisks really show the significance. And that's really important. I mean, we've seen people pulling that out as they've been talking about heat maps a lot. Um, this is all done after the fact, okay? So these are presentation graphics that also take a lot of time to try to make and, and try to make well. And so what I wanna show you is the process of doing that can be facilitated by using two interactive heat maps that are dynamically linked. And this one has the same data as this, but this has the p-value of those correlations. It's the correlations of the same you know, the variables to each other, the correlation matrix. And this one has the correlation coefficient. Okay, and so one of the things that this analyst found was, oh, that's a very good p-value. But look at its correlation coefficient. And you can see the one-to-one -one correspondence immediately because they're dynamically linked. And she started saying, I, I probably wouldn't have noticed that one, and yet this is really important because they're looking at methylation sites and they want to know what's important. So then they begin to think about their data, and it's like, well, it's small samples. What can we really tell? What should we be looking for? And so this all, it's not necessarily that these tools are going to give you a discovery, but they're going to spark you to think about things like this um, and use your visual system to really facilitate that. You can also look at, as Chuck mentioned, you can look at metabolites correlated with clinical measures. So this is a chart of female, obese females after they lost weight and they're looking at isoleucine, leucine, and valine as they relate to fasting insulin. And you can see the correlations there. And if you want here too, you can do two dynamically linked heat maps and you can put the data of the before weight loss and the after weight loss right next to each other and see, well, 
has it changed? Has this relationship between isoleucine, leucine, and valine and fasting glucose changed before weight loss and after weight loss? And here you have the analyst's kind of thoughts as she's looking at this. Um, she would have liked to have seen a change, but then when she thought about it, she goes, well, no, because they're still obese, so it probably wouldn't have changed in those ways. And so it begins, and those are the kinds of stories that you can really help to do with these graphs. Um, you can also compare cohorts so that you have that same study um, in terms of obese and weight loss, and you have the, the females and the males, and you can see whether those same relationships, whether those relationships were the same between males and females or whether they were slightly different and try to figure out, you know, is that important? Are you seeing something that's worth looking into more? Can you explain that in some ways? So I hope that I've given you some idea of how you can walk through a tool like this. Um, it's, I think that one of the most important things is these aren't quick fixes at all. Um, they take time. You're just going through them. Um, and from what I've seen from people that I work with is it's worth it because of how well they know their data when they're done with it and how much they trust their data when they're done with it. And so I think they're very, very um, important tools to help you vet or confirm or uncover unexpected things. Um, you can quickly relate a number of variables. You know, you can see that five variables are all the same um, and group them by similarity and by class and see what goes up together, or what goes up, what goes um, up, to get up or down inversely in the same pathway, what's significant. You can relate heterogeneous relationships and make comparisons, a number of different kinds of comparisons, and all of it by imposing your own expertise to get an understanding of those relationships. I want to really thank the CoolMap team. Um, it was developers and is still under development uh, by people in Fan Meng's lab, um, Gang Su initially, and now Kijang Li is building it up even farther. And we have, we've had a visualization um, analytics consultant throughout the whole development. I've been the usability and user experience person. And we've had a number of trial users. Um, and I, I specifically don't give any names here because we don't reveal our users. But they are, we can say what labs they're from. And so, you know, that has really helped us to develop so that things are really in sync with the ways that people analyze their data. So with that, I want to end and see if there's any questions. Yes. So basically, you can go to the website and we can utilize CoolMap right now. Um, basically, you can talk to me and you can <laughs> utilize CoolMap right now. There is a website that will tell you all about it, but you need a link to get into where it is. And we like to keep track of who's using it because we're working on specific things and we like feedback on them. Okay? Yes. So is CoolMap something that can be applied across different omics platforms? Yes. Actually, it was first applied to transcriptomics, but then to metabolomics a lot, too. And mixing them. So the, the not only the lipidomics, but also other, uh, some like high throughput data can be uh, used using this uh, cool map. It has to be normalized. It has to, to be, be in the right format so that you can run the... Okay. Correlations, yeah. And then after normalize, and so as long as we have uh, like the input data, then yes. Okay. Yeah. No. And it's 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 you have input data in an Excel file or in a comma, you know, a text file. So I just make a comment. So I use this all the time. Um, it's really it's it's you know. For someone who always had to go find uh, one of the people in the lab to write me an R code and make a GUI so I can actually, you know, do uh, something, it's really a very user friendly. There's a little bit of a learning curve, but once you learn how to use it, um, you know, I I spend a lot of time looking at these big data sets. And as far as integration, you know, so I use it with transcriptomics. I use it with the diet data that I showed you before. That was all done with the Cool Map, and it's just getting the in the in the uh, the right. Um, sort of ontology, if you get the ontology in there 
right, which I think, I don't know, it's the gotten easier as well. The will create your ontologies yeah. for you. you and so all you have to do is get the right headers, and it'll go, it'll go right into the program, and then you can collapse things. You can get rid of part of it. Remember what I was saying, that you know, just look at smaller pieces of data because you can actually find more in there. The collapsing function really helps do that. And so you just get rid of all that other stuff, that extraneous stuff, and you can actually you know dig through this. And it's great to mine data just to just to start thinking about it. And like, and then you get like Barbara says, you really get to know your data really well when you actually t you know, spend a couple hours looking at it. Because you know with these big data sets and these relationships, it's like, oh my God, what am I going to do? And which is the biggest complaint that we get from a lot of people when we dump the data on them. It's like, now what do I do? And so this is a, this is a good way to do it. So. That's, and and I'm, I'm one model, of the users. I'll, I'll self-identify. That's right. In terms of the mental model, it clears out a lot of the noise because you know already which relationships you don't want to look at. And so that gives you a framing of how you want to do it. The latest COMAP also, and this is really more for transcripts than it is for metabolites right now, but it does let you take some correlations that you're really interested in and go out into um, a Cytoscape plugin that's called React, it's a Reactome plugin, and you could see those data in the Reactome pathways. Yes? Um, I really don't know much about the heat map, but I really want to know. So, underneath the heat map for the metabolomics data, when you use heat map, this color represents the response of the analytes. Yes, oh. and I should have really made that. Yeah, it's the values. So that you, you know, the first ones that I showed that have your samples, let's say across the columns, and then your metabolites across the rows, it would show you what the value is for That's every sample. That's the intensity. Just the only. value. Yeah, but if you have a correlation coefficient, if you have a correlation matrix, then it tells you that like the leucine and isoleucine correlation is that color. So it colors it from minus one to one for your correlations. Oh, okay. <laughs> I guess I... Does that make sense? It doesn't still, huh? So what exactly the correlation means? Do you mean the, like, uh, the mass to charge uh, value or the, 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 the what? They're the same, they're close to the same value. It doesn't mean that they're interacting. It doesn't mean that they go up together or anything like that. It just means that you have whatever value you get out of the instrumentation um, and then work through and, and normalize and all of that. That's the value you put in. And it says that that, for your samples, um, if it clusters them, that means the two things that are clustered together have a similarly high value. Their values are okay, similar. Okay, I see. For the cluster. So the correlation, if it's uh, one, it means it's the same, that correlated very well? Or? Yeah, it means that they're both about the same value. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I think we have a break now, and then we'll come back.